Hey everybody, welcome to week three of our Getting Started series on vintage sewing machines. Um, I know it's scheduled for a holiday and that's my fault. I just did not look far ahead enough in the schedule, but many of you said that you were traveling and you were happy to join. So if you're with me, thank you. That means the world to me. I'm sure most of you will catch the replay, which is equally as awesome. I'm just glad you're here. Um, today we are going to be covering getting started with your machine as far as threading the bobbin, winding a bobbin, getting it inserted correctly. And then um, at the end, I'm going to do two sessions, one on a Class 66, um, which is a very common vintage sewing machine. I'm going to show you how to thread a Class 15. It would be the same as if it were a Singer. I didn't have a Singer handy, so I'm using a Japanese clone, which is very, very, very common. Um, if anybody that has gotten into vintage sewing machine restoration or maintenance or using them, very rarely do I know someone that doesn't have some type of clone machine or reproduction or something that's very similar to a class 15. Those are the ones that have the tension assembly on the side. Um, so I did that. And then I'm going to end our session today with a segment from, it's one of the actual curriculum modules from our Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery Group that's going to walk you through threading um, a class, like a Singer 400 or 500 series but it's also going to go through adjusting tension, which I know a lot of you struggle with. So that one's going to go through the full gamut of winding the bobbin, threading it, and test sewing with it, and adjusting the tension to get it perfect. So I could, there's no way I can cover everything I really wanted to in the series, especially this segment here. So this has inspired me to build a free workshop teaching you how to thread numerous machines. So in here, we covered three of hundreds, and I'd really like to put together a free workshop that'll be a little more inclusive. We'll include Elnas and Boffs and Brothers and Vikings and Howes and all the other machines you can think of. It'll take me a little time, but we'll do what we always do. We will get the basis up there for you to get you started. So you have kind of like a guidebook and then we'll just keep adding to it. So the way that I teach my workshops and the way that I teach people who come into my realm and want to learn how to work on machines and even use them, I do prefer to teach not using service manuals. You'll see in the vintage machine groups that people are always asking for the manual. I don't think there's anything wrong with using a manual. Um, it's a great resource if you need it, but the truth is most of the manuals were made for to be a reminder to the technician. So back in the day, Singer technicians, um, whatever other brands you had, all went to a factory. They learned how to service and maintain the machines. And then they had the manual as sort of like a reminder. It's not usually complete. So even if it tells you to do steps one, two, three, it's missing all of the A, B, C, D, E's, and F's in between step one and two, if that makes sense. It's just kind of like a checkpoint reminder. So I would much rather you have the instincts and the intuition that you can build naturally whether it is for threading the machine, looking at a sewing machine and understanding how the path works so that if you sit down in front of any machine, you can get to the point where you actually can figure it out. That's been the case. People ask me all the time, how can you do this so quickly? Well, when you've been doing this for 13 years and you've threaded thousands of machines, it's an instinct. It's not, and I don't think you have to thread thousands of machines to build your instincts. So everything I do kind of moves in an intuitive manner so that you don't have to rely on a manual if that makes sense. But I would like to do a walkthrough course to help get you there so that you're not just stuck um, searching the internet and looking for some really crappy videos to walk you through. Finding a machine that's like yours, but just enough different, I'd really rather get you comfortable with using your machine. So again, that's going to be our plan for today. Let me remind you that next Monday is our big day. The enrollment period opens for the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery. It's our open house event. I promise you, yes, I'm going to talk about what's in the workshop. I'm going to tell you what it costs. I'm going to give you all the benefits. I'm going to do all those things. But I I am not a salesperson. I, I, that is not where my skill is, and I'm not trying to be. Basically, we have built this magical, um, I wish I could have find another word, but everybody in our group, I'm re, re, like it resonates that it is magic. It's not just me leading you through step-by-step how to fix sewing machines. It's not telling me just telling you how to, you know, restore a machine and bring it back to life. There is a magic in our group that I just cannot find another word for. There's a connection. Um, it's so nice that it's kind of like our reprieve from the real world right now. Um, 
I would say that we're all carrying some type of trauma with us um, through COVID and through struggle, the inflation, the economy. There's so much coming at us that sewing machines have been my saving grace. For 13 years, I've been able to fix machines and bring them back to life. And it has built such a confidence and such a satisfaction that it, you can remove the money part. It is my living, but I don't worry about the money because it's the value. Being able to sit down and take this thing that's out, it's older than I am and make it work again is so satisfying. So we have built this group for those that need to go beyond YouTube videos and finding a manual and just going at it alone. If you want a support group and you want new friends that connect on this basis and then go beyond, that is what our group is. And I'm going to bring that to you next Monday. We do have a few little cheesy things I like to do. I do like to thank you all for showing up. So there will be bonuses for enrollment, but I'm going to do a few giveaways, some things that I've collected over time. Paul ran across one of his custom seam rippers. Now, he, if you knew Paul um, here in the Atlanta area, he was known as a seam ripper guy and also known as Andy's husband at all the shows. He turns, he's a wood turner and an acrylic lathe turner. So these are his custom seam rippers that he makes. We spent a good year way back when, when I first started quilting. I always used to joke that I, I unripped enough quilts that he had to develop a seam ripper just for me because I my arthritis was getting so bad. And so we spent a lot of time getting the exact weight and shape of this to be correct. So when you're doing a lot of seam ripping, the weight of it and the shape is good because it's not those little tiny things you're trying to do. So on one end, there is a seam ripper. And on the other end, there is a stiletto, which if you're feeding a seam through the machine that's really tight and you have to keep it together, this will keep you from sewing through your finger, but also keeps your seams together. Um, it also works if you're at a quilt retreat or something really late at night and you have to leave and you need an instant weapon, you have this in your pocket. So um, we have, I think, this one. Oh. We have your choice of purple or orange. That's all I have at the moment, but I will, um, we are giving away one of these and maybe if Paul's generous, I can get him to give away both of them. So we will have these for giveaways at the end of the open house. We're gonna give away a few fun gift cards. We're gonna give away some of our favorite tools from uh, Harbor Freight that we use in machine service. If you're just cleaning and lubricating or whatever, even if you're not interested in restoration, these are so handy for so many things. And we also have this pack that I just tried out within the last few months for cleaning machines. And I absolutely love what's in this pack. I wish that I would have had these 10 years ago. So we're going to do a bunch of giveaways at the end of our open house next week. So if you have not signed up for that, if you're already getting the emails, um, the reminders every week to tell you to come here for the live, you're going to automatically get a reminder and the link to the um, open house. If not, you can follow the website to sewingdocacademy.com slash VSMM and you'll see the little form there just to get the reminder. I do not have time to spam you, so I promise I'm not going to take advantage of your email. Okay, so that's what that link is. If you happen to miss the last two weeks of um, free streaming that I did on getting started with vintage machines, you can find those replays and the handouts here at sewingdocacademy.com slash FB live. And in fact, because it is a holiday, I don't want you to have to sit and wait on me to respond. Once I finish today's broadcast, I am going to hightail it to dinner um, and spend some time with family that's much needed um, to go into the next week. And you will find today's handout. It will probably be uploaded uh, within the next hour. The replay is going to take a minute, but the handout will be there um, for you at the same link. Okay. And I will make this reminder I'll talk about this again more next week um, in the open house. If you have been considering joining the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery and you have a few machines, but you're really not sure, are they worth saving? Is the machine too far gone? Am I crazy for getting into this? We are still offering our free evaluation program. Um, if you will go to sewingdocacademy.com slash evaluations, there is going to be a form for you to enter your name and your email address. You will get back an automated email asking you five or six questions about your machine and asking you to upload a few pictures to me. And then we're going to look at your machine. I can point out any red flags, any major concerns that I have of like, I see parts missing that are hard to get. No, this is an easy one. I'll give you full 100% honest feedback of, Maybe it's best to let that one go. And I know from experience, I have people email me probably, 
I still get about 10 to 15 emails a week of people saying, I'd like to have this restored, but I'm sure it's gonna cost me an arm and a leg or it's too far gone. And I can only think of two machines that we've ever turned down. And that's because one had been sitting in a lake uh, that's probably savable, but not something I can teach you or do for you. And then um, the other case, I think they were missing. It was a odd production and I just couldn't find the parts and I will not take on um, having to give you any cost and something of no value. OK, so that is always an offer. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to message me and I'll give you all the information. OK. I think that is all I have for today. So, again, we're going to move into um, winding a bobbin, threading your machine, and getting started. So we'll have two videos showing you threading and bobbin stuff. And then the third video is going to be an actual um, portion of a module within the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery Learning Library that's going to go through threading that particular machine, making your first stitches, and balancing the, um, the tension. So I cannot thank you all enough for having joined me for the last three Mondays and next week um, or the replay or however you've joined me. Um, this is what I live for, being able to pass on all of our knowledge, the things we do every single day in our service shop to those who want to help us save these machines. Um, I don't know where I would be in my life without sewing machines and the community that's built around it. I have conversations with people everywhere I go uh, uh, with the history of their grandmother's machine, how they came into sewing and quilting. I just, this has lit up my life so much. And for you to be able to join me on this journey now, it has just reached, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Um, I get, I just, it, it's taken us to new heights and I, my heart sings being able to connect with people. And as we sort out problems and we learn together and we teach each other, that is exactly what the Vintage Sewing Machine Mastery embodies. So thank you again for joining me. Please enjoy the material and I will try to answer some questions after. Okay, so we're going to start with a Singer 66, which is a fairly common machine in the vintage realm. They are um, on the lower end of cost because there were so many of them made. This is a basic black with your um, regular scroll decals. They make 66s with different, like there's the red eye that has the red lotus flowers on it. There's a lotus design. There's a gingerbread. There's a Tiffany. There's so many different designs, but it's a good basic machine um, that will never fail you really if it's cared for. So we're going to now, I want to be transparent. The machines that I have to show you to thread on, I did not think ahead for the holiday weekend, but um, the machines I'm going to show you are in for restoration or service by my customers, which is real world. So that's one reason why I like to do it this way, but they are not complete. So you can see this customer's machine's missing the slide plate, which means it would not be excellent for sewing on. So I'm just going to show you winding a bobbin threading and doing some basics on a few machines. And then at the end of this, there will be a much longer segment, probably about 20 minutes. It's going to walk you through um, threading and tension adjustment. And that's an actual module in our vintage uh, sewing machine mastery curriculum. So if you enroll in our workshop, it's one of the modules of, gosh, there's probably 100 modules in there at this point. So what we want to cover here is getting it threaded, making sure you understand how the machine functions and getting started. In the handout, I will have a lot more details on things like thread and needle position and all that. If There's so many facets to this that I am building a free workshop on this. So this is really just scratching the surface on any of this information. If you have a machine and you're not sure which bobbin it uses, what needle or how, how it needs to be positioned, please drop a comment. You don't have to do it during this broadcast, but you're all, all excuse me, always welcome to message me or email me and I'm happy to help you through those questions you may have. Okay. So the first thing I want to note with the being a singer 66, um, the bobbin that this machine uses is a class 66, uh, which makes it easy to remember. I'm trying to use threads that you can see when I'm threading, but this is um, a class 66 bobbin. It's real easy to confuse your bobbins when you don't know. So I, if, again, if you have an issue identifying what bobbin your machine uses, please let me know because it does matter. If you put any old bobbin in there and it's not the correct bobbin, you're going to be so frustrated because it will not work properly and you run the risk of um, just making it a miserable experience. So on the left here is the class 66 and this is the more modern version. Um, the older ones sometimes only have one little hole in them, but they always have a bit of a rounded top. The class 15 is um, more 
flat on top and it has holes and, um, you know, more holes comparatively. So those are the two most common bobbins you see. If you have a Foff, Brunina, Elna, Viking, any of those, there's a bunch of machines that use specific bobbins. So I'm going to show you how we're going to start by winding a bobbin. Let me grab a class 66 bobbin and they do go on the machine. Uh, yeah, just want to make sure that works. Um, so this is your bobbin winder up here and you should have a tension, some type of tension assembly, either a little hook like this one or a little, um, kind of like on your modern machine, a little button here, it looks like. So what you would do, and I'm not going to actually wind a bobbin on here again, because this machine doesn't work, but you would take your bobbin and you have to release if this is, you don't want this sitting on your thing. So you're going to release this and you're going to slide your bobbin on. And there's usually a way it has to go on there so that it sits. And when this turns, the whole bobbin turns. Now I will be a little bit transparent in that some of the modern bobbins don't work as great and don't fit as well in here, but this one seems to be working just fine. Okay. So what we're going to do, first of all, make your make sure your machine is not in reverse. If you if you have one of these types of machines with a lever, reverse is at the very top. It says back tack here, which is also reverse. So standard stitch length is around 12 stitches per inch, which is what these numbers mean. So I just put it there even while winding a bobbin to create to not create any issues. All right. So first we're going to load our thread and I'm using a red thread here so that it's easier for you to see. For winding a bobbin on this type of machine, you're gonna put your spool of thread up here and you want the thread coming from behind. Um, if you have it this way, it's coming in front, you want the thread unwinding from behind, okay? And you're gonna see a thread guide up here. You're, when you go from your spool pin, no matter what type of machine you have, there's going to be some kind of thread guide. So you can take it through the thread guide and then we're gonna come down here to the hook and I'm gonna wrap it so that's a figure eight and then I'm gonna bring it up to the bobbin. And let me see if I can zoom in a little bit for you. And I'm gonna go from the inside of the bobbin through to the outside of this hole. And I'm gonna hold this. Now what you would do here is you're going to loosen the clutch. This is your clutch hand wheel. So you're gonna loosen this. And when you do that, I'm not gonna say if your machine's not being cleaned or lubricated yet, your needle bar is still probably going to move. But what this does is release the shaft up here that runs in the machine so that hopefully the bob, the hand wheel and the bobbin winder will move, but your needle won't. I can almost guarantee you in this case, because this machine's not been worked on yet, that it won't, that's not going to work properly. So here at this point, you would be holding this and you're gently going to press the pedal to give it a little bit of gas so it'll start winding. Since I don't have a foot pedal, I'm going to go ahead and just demonstrate manually. So you can see if I turn the hand wheel toward me, it's still going to wind the bobbin properly. Okay, just much, much, much slower. But let me see if I can wind enough so I can show you how to um, insert your bobbin properly. So you can see while this could be painful and painstaking, you had a reason to, you could do this manually. All right, so I'm gonna take my scissors. And at some point you can stop winding and go ahead and trim this off. Then you don't have to hold it. And then you can still keep, you can still keep winding your bobbin. All right. Well, when you get a nice full bobbin, you want to pay attention. This is supposed to um, basically let go when the bobbin's full. I would not count on that. It's give or take, depending on the condition and the age of the machine, all kinds of factors. I'm going to go ahead and cut my thread here. So now I have my bobbin. You're just going to push this lever back and pull your bobbin off. All right. And then leave that disengaged. And over here, we're going to work on, let's do the upper thread. Actually, let's do the bobbin first. So we're going to go ahead and get our bobbin inserted. All right. And this is what kind of trips people up a lot, if, depending on what you're already using for a sewing machine if you're brand new. So the rule of thumb is um, on almost every single bobbin case, like this is called a drop-in bobbin. You want the thread to be winding counterclockwise. This matters so importantly. I can't even tell you how important it is to put your bobbin in correctly. Um, I would say at least two or three times a week, a customer comes into the shop, doesn't matter if it's a modern machine or vintage machine, and they're afraid that they have broken their machine, something's wrong, they've wasted an hour figuring it out, and it's simply that the bobbin is in the wrong direction, okay? So on most of these, you need it to be winding counterclockwise. And you're going to drop this into the bobbin case. 
And what I want you to pay attention to, let me grab a, something to point with here, is that you're going to see a little notch right here. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit for you without losing. It's a really hard with the glare, but you're going to see a notch right in here in the bobbin case. And you're going to take your thread and you're going to pull it to the left so that it goes into this little notch. And now when I pull up on it, you can see it stays there. So let me take a picture and I will post that with this. And this is pretty much true even for modern machines, other vintage machines, most machines that have a drop and bobbin work in the same orientation. So now I can pull this a little bit. You do want a bit of a tail here, okay? This is your bobbin tail. Now what we're gonna do is turn back up here and we're gonna thread the upper thread. All right, so our upper thread, we have our thread on our spool. And this is a little longer than I like to work with, but we can make it work. A couple rules on um, threading your machine. Oh, you do need to tighten your clutch wheel back up if you have one. And make sure that you only turn your hand wheel toward you. That's a big rule of thumb on every single sewing machine, unless you're using a rotary. If you have a motor back here and it, there's no belt and it sits directly on the wheel, then you have a rotary and you have to turn this way. Um, but if you're using any other type of machine, you always turn your hand wheel toward you, okay? Um, what I'm going to suggest you do, you and then off, same thing. This is another universal rule most people don't realize. When you thread your machine, your presser foot has to be in the upper position. So I want to show you why. If you look at the tension disc here, this is your tension disc, okay? This is what puts the amount of pressure on your upper thread so that you get those nice, beautiful stitches. If you see... Um, it's really hard to see on this one. It's probably a little too microscopic. But every time I open up the tension disc, you can see it open. And I don't think the camera is going to pick that up. But if you can, that's great. So when your presser foot is up, it's opening these tension discs. You can see they're a little bit wiggly here. If I put them down, there's no, there's no wiggle at all. That's spring, yes, but there's no wiggle between them. This way I can actually get in here and kind of, all right. So you want your tension disc open. And you're going to hold some tension with your right hand up here, and you're going to wrap through those two tension discs. You have to make sure it's through the two silver tension discs. You're going to bring it up, and you can see there's a little curly cue. This is called your check spring. Let me get in here a little bit for you. This little spring here is called your check spring. And while holding tension up here on this thread, you're going to bring the thread around, and you're going to take it behind that hook. So now when you pull down, it's pulling that check spring. So there's a little bit of spring to it. So you want it through the tension disc, through the spring, and then you're going to take it up through this little hook. This helps keep the tension proper when the needle goes up and down. Okay. Now this is your take up lever up here and you're going to bring your thread up and you're going to thread from right to left through the take up lever. All right. So this is what it should look like so far. Now, if you're following here on the side, there is a thread hook right here. So you're gonna put your thread through that and you'll see a little cutout where the thread goes and one more thread guide here at the needle and you're gonna put it through the needle. Now, this is how it's real easy for me to remember which direction to thread. The thread guide automatically brought it to the left. So I know that I need to thread this needle left to right. So I'm gonna go ahead and thread this. Again, this is very, very important. If you have it threaded the wrong direction, you're going to get broken threads and it's not going to sew and you're just going to think the machine is stupid or broken. <laughs> All right, so threaded through the needle. Now, I always like to test um, one thing, and this doesn't matter if it's modern or vintage. Once I have this through, you can see with the tension disc open, I can very easily pull this thread. If I put the presser foot down, there's too much resistance and I, I can pull it, but it's a little bit harder. You don't want to yank anything. That's always my test, okay? So put your presser foot back up for a minute. And this is one other tip I like to offer for everybody, even if it's a modern machine. You're going to hold your upper thread tail. So here's the bobbin one. Here's my upper thread. I'm going to turn my hand wheel toward me. You're going to see the needle go down and the needle is going to come back up. And if you watch over here by the bobbin, it's going to bring me that bobbin thread through that hole. All right. I'm going to grab that. Now I have a hold of both tails in my hand. So when I start to sew 
my stitches are going to start out beautifully rather than being tangled up and that's going to prevent thread nest. Okay. So I highly recommend regardless of what machine, I don't care if you have a computerized machine with a thread cutter, if you bring up your tails to start with, that ensures a better stitch um, success in my opinion. Okay. So that is a class 66. I'm going to switch over here. So give me just a second. Okay, so what I have in front of me now is what they consider a class 15 clone or a Japanese made. Um, I have a whole, if you missed the lecture I did in January 2022, I definitely recommend going back. I talk about Japanese reproduction machines. The reason I pulled this one out is because I don't have an actual Singer 15 available to me at the moment. And what tends to trip people up is what to do when your tension assembly is way back here rather than being in the front where you're used to it, okay? And I think actually I can probably illustrate a little bit better because it's easier to get to. Now I want I do want to note the reason this customer's machine is here is that the take up lever was actually bent. So um, again, I'm just threading on this machine. I'm not going to actually sew on it. So just to do a brief overview on the bobbin monitor, this works exactly like the one I showed you on the Singer um, 66 just a minute ago. But what I want to point out is it looks a little bit different, but the same concept. This one uses the class 15 bobbin that we talked about that's flat with the holes in the top. And you're going to do the same thing. You would um, make sure that this is released. You're gonna put your bobbin on and you're gonna see a little notch um, here in the bobbin that usually corresponds with a little notch on the post. If you look really close, I don't, don't know if I can quite get the camera to pick it up, but there is a tiny notch right here on the edge. I don't think it's going to pick, maybe it will. So when you slide your bobbin on, you're going to need to turn it and you'll see that it's actually going to sit in there. If you just have it like this, it's not going to do anything. If you, you can turn it and they will meet, you can feel it actually kind of like snap in there. Okay. And then you're going to engage it by pushing it down. And this little piece is going to ride in the bobbin the same way. Do the same thing over here. Loosen your, um, your clutch wheel if you have one. And if your needle bar still moves, it's really not a problem. This one, the belt is barely attached. This one's going through restoration, okay? So now that you've got your bobbin loaded on there, let me get zoomed out a little bit. This is the type of uh, bobbin winder I was talking about on the 66. So on the 66, we had the little Z-shaped hook. This one is the button one I'm talking about. So you can see this actually has a tension assembly here, which I think I need to tighten. But anyway, let's um, get our thread up here. So same way, thread, set your thread on the top. And, oh, I'm sorry, the one that's different here is that you have a spool pin down here for your bobbin winder. So instead, we're going to put our bobbin, our thread here so that it's unwinding from the front this time. You're going to take it through the tension disc. And you don't want too long of a thread here. Um, what you want to do is draw your thread up. I'm going to focus up here on the bobbin winder. So we're going to draw our thread up and then we're going to do the same thing from the inside of the bobbin to the outside through the hole. So you have something to hold on to. And then you're going to, now in this case, I don't know. Let's see if I can make it work manually. Got to get my bobbin in there. Yeah. So I can't keep it in there because it's this one needs some work, but you're going to do the same thing. You're going to run your pedal and this is going to wind here. OK, that's I just want to show you how to thread it. Follow the exact same instructions as on the class 66 machine. As far as threading, so I have another bobbin here that already has thread on it and I'm trying to use contrasting colors so you can see the thread better. Let's go ahead and thread the machine. So we're going to start by putting our thread up here again with the thread coming off the back of the uh, the spool. So this is going to go up here. And now I'm going to turn the machine so you can see a little bit better. All right. So you should have here on the back some type of thread guide. In this case, it's, it's what they call a pigtail. So you can see there's a little curly cue here that's a thread guide. That's typically what I see. But on an actual Singer class... 15, right up here at the top, you're just going to see a little cutout, like a little thing sticking up that's got a notch in it. Whatever you have there, your thread has to go through there first. So on the pigtail, it kind of wraps around a little weird, okay? Again, make sure your presser foot is up and your needle is up. And if you didn't tighten your clutch wheel, go ahead and do that. So here's my presser foot lever. Make sure it's up. And this is going to follow 
a similar concept to what we just did in the 66, but it's going to be a little bit backwards. We're actually working left to right now. Okay, so put a little tension up here on your thread. You're going to bring this around. And now on this type, there is a little um, spring here. Let me see if I can get in there a little closer. There's a little spring here that you have to kind of get your thread through. Yeah, I kind of you kind of have to wrap it around and I'll I'll get a good picture to include. Um, and it's hard to do with a camera in my way. So give me just a second to figure this out. So we don't want to wrap it around. There. Nope. Yeah, it's in there. OK. So you can see when you want it, you can even just thread it through that loop. But what you want when you pull on this thread, you want it to spring back and forth. It's literally just looped through that little loop. OK, that's as long as we have that, we're good. But you are going to bring it around this. Are we? No, we're not. actually. Yeah, we are. We're going to bring it around this little um, lever. I had to think about that for a second. OK, and then we are going to come back up here to your take up lever and we're going to go left to right through the take up lever, making sure everything stays in place. No, this actually does not go around this um, this lever. I'm sorry. They're all a little different. And I, I'm usually an autopilot, so I have to think about it for a minute. But you can see if I yank on this thread a little bit, that spring moves. That's exactly what we want. Now we have a thread guide here. So I'm just going to, it just snaps through or you can thread it through. And then down here at the bottom, we have that last thread guide like we did on the 66. So it's going to go through the thread guide and then it's going to thread left to right. So if you're looking at your machine, it's going to go left to right. On these two machines, on both the 66 and the 15, the needle is flat side to the right. Again, that is also very important. All right. So as far as our, now we have our upper thread done, let's go back to our bobbin case for a minute. So this is an external bobbin case. If you're new to these, it works in the same concept. It just goes into the side or the front of the machine, which is down in here. So this is the area where your bobbin case is going to go. I'm using white thread. You should be using the same thread in top and bottom to test, but I'm doing different colors of thread so you can see them. Now with our wound bobbin on, if you're, this is the little hole where your thread needs to come out. If it is on the left side of the bobbin case, when you're looking at the back, you need your thread to be threaded going clockwise. So you can see my thread is winding clockwise. So you're going to insert this in here and you're going to take your thread and you're going to go counterclockwise to thread it through. So I hold the bobbin in place and you're going to snap this through your tension. OK, so you should be able to pull that through a little, with a little bit of resistance. You're going to leave a tail. Oh, and this is going to happen a lot. You may you may drop it. You're going to have all kinds of things. So that's a good example. Let me do this again. So you're remember, you're going to want your thread to be threaded clockwise and you're going to slip it in here and you're going to thread it through. I hold the bobbin in place. You see my fingers are pinched and that's going to allow me to draw it through the spring. So it should be coming out that little hole underneath of this little spring. OK, so I'm going to leave a tail about this long and I'm going to snap this into the machine. You have to keep the you can use this latch here. So you can hold the latch and insert this in there. There's a little notch here on the top where this has to fit in just right. And once it's in there, you let go of the latch and just make sure it's in there securely, okay? Leave this tail, turn your machine back around, and we're gonna do the exact same thing that we did on the 66 that I recommend for every machine. Hold your upper thread tail, turn your hand wheel toward you. Oh, make sure my clutch is locked. And then your needle is going to go down once and come back up. And then there's my bobbin thread. OK, so now I have both of these together. So when you start that seam, you put your presser foot down. And so you have control of your tails for a much nicer, sti nicer stitch. OK, so that's a class 15 and any of the millions of Japanese clones that are out there. Anytime that you see that thread tension assembly in the back or on the side like you do here, then you know that this is the threading technique. All right, we're going to get into the threading and sewing and adjusting um, portion of this. I have not adjusted the tension in this, um, the upper 
or lower tension and I did that intentionally so that we could go through it together. So um, please know how to operate your machine. If you have a manual, please read it. Make sure you understand how to thread it. We do cover a lot of that in this course. And of course, if you have, op if you're stuck on something, um, let me know. If you're having issues with getting it to sew a stitch, the best thing you can do is either post a short video or some pictures of your entire threading path because all it takes is missing one thing on your machine and it won't sew. All right, so um, we are going to start with um, needle insertion. There is an entire section about needle insertion and proper needles, um, so please review that if you need to. I plan to do another separate workshop, both having to do with thread and needle because think back the sewing experience far more than just about anything else. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and put in a um, whenever we service machines in the shop, when they're done, they do get a universal 8012 needle. My advice when you're test sewing on any machine, regardless of whether it's one you've owned for ages or new to you, um, always start with basic cotton. Don't, even if you sew only on canvas or vinyl or whatever, always test your machine with basic quilt, quilting cotton. No knits, no anything else. The reason being, if there's an issue with your machine, you want to out all of those external influences. So that means you could be sewing a knit and the needle you're using or the thread you're using isn't compatible with the fabric for whatever reason. And that will drive you crazy thinking it's something with your machine. If your machine is forming a stitch, even if it isn't pretty, chances are it is not your machine. Okay. So basic thread, no heavy duty, no nothing. Um, I highly, again, I will do an entire section about thread and needles. Um, Orifil is my number one. It's the least lengthy of cotton. I typically use those on most machines, vintage or new. Um, when you get into the touch and sews, which we don't really cover in this course, um, and maybe sometimes the 66s, it just depends on the machine. Um, I will go to Guterman because it is slightly thicker. So in this instance, I am going to use Guterman. I'm going to go ahead and um, get my upper thread threaded. So on this machine, um, if you've never done a 500 before, Again, thread your machine accordingly, but this goes through an upper thread guide. There should almost always be an upper thread guide somewhere in your machine. Now the 500 is a little bit weird because you have this little component here where the thread goes through before it gets to the tension discs. So I'm going to go ahead and get that threaded through. And then now we're going to wrap around the tension assembly. I like to keep tension up here on my thread and make sure your presser foot is up and you're going to go through the tension disc and if you have a machine like this that has several sets of tension discs for double threads in there you just pick one and you're going to draw it up until the thread snaps behind the hook I'm going to put it behind the thread guide right to left through the take up lever all right back down through this thread guide and now is a good time if you want to check your tension disc especially if you took this apart uh, for cleaning when you get to this point, put your presser foot down and now you should have, you should not be able to move your thread. Please don't yank or force anything, just pulling on it. You can see the check springs moving like it should, but the tension's too tight for me to draw the thread down. So that's why your thread, your presser foot has to be up when you're threading your machine. If you try to do this with it closed, then they're going to ride along the, the disc and not really get good tension. All right, so let's lift our presser foot back up and continuing on. I've got three thread guides, so I'm going to go through the first one the second one, and the third one. It is very important that you don't miss any thread guides. They are there for a reason. And if you have a broken one or something seems missing, post a picture with the model and uh, brand of your machine, and I can help you determine that. But in 99% of cases, something's going to have to be fixed or replaced because um, machines won't um, work properly without the thread guides. And on this particular machine, it's front to back. Again, I will do a section on inserting the, the needle properly based on different models. And now I'm going to put my bobbin case in. I'm using a different color in the bobbin case. Uh, the only thing that matters is that the thread type and preferably the brand are the same in top and bottom. These are both Guterman and they're both 40 weight, so I'm not worried. I sometimes like to do two different colors so I can match the tension a little bit better. But if you put or fill on the top and you have Coates and Clark in the bottom, this is not to work for setting your tension. So just make sure it's just best to use the same thread in top and bottom when you're test sewing. Almost messed myself up on that one. This one actually takes a 66, class 66. All right, so I'm going to insert my bobbin correctly into the bobbin case. 
make sure there's a tail but not too long of a tail um, so I'm going to insert it and again if you're not sure how to thread it please read your manual and if you need help please let me know we're going to do everything as a tension is set right now and we're going to adjust accordingly so again I'm going to put my upper tension if you're to tell you how to balance this this is what I do put your upper tension on four um, and then I'm going to hold the tail of my top thread drop the needle down by turning the hand wheel toward you and bring the thread up to the top and that's going to bring up your bobbin thread and then I'm going to close my door I am going to select a zigzag stitch you want to do it about um, you don't want to do it too wide because it will pucker your fabric but the reason we test sew with a zigzag is because timing issues or whatever issues can be hidden with a straight stitch where they can't with the zigzag okay so with everything threaded properly I did drop my um, my bobbin thread and I'm gonna start with a zigzag and I you want to do a not a tiny zigzag but you don't want to do the full width the reason being when you're sewing two pieces of cotton together with no stabilizer it will pucker the fabric so we just want to be able to test the tension on a zigzag so you're gonna see I'm gonna do quite a small zigzag here but I'm gonna go ahead and sew one line it up and I'm gonna so the top tension looks okay bottom tension looks um, a little tight on the bobbin so so if you see um, it should be a nice even clean this is just barely off but it's definitely pulling the thread to the bottom so I'm going to loosen my bobbin tension I know this scares a lot of you you're gonna look for the spring closest to so you have a tension spring over here you're gonna look for the screw closest to it I'm just gonna turn it not even maybe a quarter of a turn so I'm going to loosen it. If you don't understand how to adjust tension, I will put up some supplemental learning materials, but you definitely need to get comfortable with adjusting upper and lower tension. Again, remember I have my upper tension set at four. That is like the ideal um, setting. Okay, so we're going to try this again. Again, now now I look like I have the opposite issue so you can see it's a delicate balance um, my tension to me actually looks too, too um, tight on top so I'm gonna go back and tighten this this is just micro movements I moved it a quarter of a turn now I'm gonna bump it not even an eighth probably just gonna bump it slightly and if you have to take your your bobbin case out I'm used to doing this with it in there if it allows me to so um, do it how, however you need to Remember, righty tidy, lefty loosey. Let's see, I'm gonna use a smaller screwdriver. Okay, let's try that. This is gonna be teeny tiny micro movements. And this is looking a lot better so it's this top it's the top line of stitches there and again now look at the bottom <laughs> so it is going to be a back and forth game what I'm going to do is loosen it a hair again and then I will probably adjust on the upper tension from there Alright, and it's almost perfect. I feel like for Guterman, that's almost as perfect as it's going to get. I will 
probably tighten my upper tension literally just a hair, not to like fully to five, not even four and a half, just a bit. And let's do one more just to see what we're looking at. So top line of stitching. Now that is as perfect as you can get, especially using Guterman, because Guterman is thicker. So that top line of stitching is what I would consider, if you look at the, this is the back, and then in this is the front. This is, to me, ideal tension. So that's what it should look like. And it is two different colors of thread. I don't know if it picks up on the, um, it's this line here. It doesn't pick up on the camera, but it's two different colors of thread. And you should just see little teeny tiny dots at the points, not thread from the other side poking through. Okay. So now let's do a straight stitch so that you can see, um, now that we know that we're okay on zigzag, we can do a straight stitch and that will let us, you know, see how good that stitch is. So let's try this again. And now you can see our straight stitch looks great. I have it set on 12. That's kind of standard. And then I'm going to do one more with the reverse, just to be sure everything works for the customer. I do want to take a minute and remind you that this machine survived a fire of some sort, and I'm very proud of our restoration work on this one. guys I wanted to just check in I don't see any questions in the modules I imagine there will be a lot in the replay I wanted to remind you that there is a handout I will have it up within the next 30 minutes if you'll follow the link that's in the description um, it is a bigger one today and I did include this is something I made when I was teaching this class live and in person years ago it is my little um, reference sheet I made it'll be in color but if you I, I, I print on black and white but it does have a picture of the most common bobbins that you'll find and vintage machines. And this is very handy because if you have multiple machines, trust me, it's really hard. Or sometimes if you buy a machine or inherit a machine, it's going to have a handful of bobbins. It could be various um, sizes and types. And the manufacturers don't give you any indicators other than things like how many holes it has or the shape. So this is a really excellent guide for identifying the bobbins you may have if you have any questions at all about that, please let me know. And then on the, this is supplemental. So there is also a whole lot of things in here about uh, links to good things on threading. There's a lot in here about that. I, I love to give a shout out to blogs who do an excellent job on the um, on sharing this knowledge, because if you have ever looked on the Internet for um, for this information, there are so many sources. And while people try, it's just it's a lot um, to filter through and try to find the good info. So I put um, a few links to blogs that I really, really appreciate their efforts on there on threading, troubleshooting. There's a whole thing about needles. I am planning a series on needles and thread by themselves, regardless of vintage or um modern machines because it's mind boggling um, all the details that go into it. And then there's also a part that has common issues down here where if you're, you know, test sewing your machine and you're having issues, it's going to have some common issues. Um, I did see that um, Jennifer commented that usually wrong bobbin, wrong needle, wrong thread. Those are the things that are typically the issue, but there could be other things. So this will be up there. If you have any questions, you're always welcome. There is an email link on here. I'm happy to help you with any of these hurdles. And um, again, that machine that you saw in that last module, 
that portion of the learning library was built with a Singer 500 machine that survived a house fire. Um, if you go to sewingdocacademy.com, on the front page, there is a video right as you scroll down that says what um, what's possible in the vintage machine workshop, I believe. That video is, um, is several things cut down into about three minutes to show you the process that I went through to um, to basically restore that machine from a house fire. And that machine was used to build portions of the learning library, which you have access to in the mastery. So again, thank you guys for joining me. It's a holiday. Um, I appreciate that you took the time to be here. And if you're watching the replay, thank you. Um, if you have not, make sure you're on the list for the open house next week. We are doing our giveaways and is when we are open enrollment. We only do that a, a full uh, maybe three or four times a year. So we like to limit how many people can come in to keep um, everybody getting one-on-one -on -one attention. So again, thank you all. It means the world to me that you show up where I can share this knowledge with you. Um, we have we're working on a tagline for an upcoming podcast, and we have decided that Sewing Doc Academy is saving the world one machine at a time. Without you guys joining me on this, um, it would really be a difficult effort. So thank you all. I will see you next week. Enjoy your day off. <laughs>